kitchen. And now, according to the plan that Philippe and I threshed out, each of us is going to reflect on some of the things that have come forth in this exercise based on our experience. So this is a moment for each of us to reflect on what has just happened and bring to bear our experience. So I think that uh, the comments about progression and continuum are very important. This is an absolutely essential component to realize that some change that's being sought is very long term. It will not happen quickly. Gandhi was so perturbed by this problem that he came up with the idea of a constructive program because some change is intergenerational. He believed he would never see certain change occur. So he came up with the idea of alternative or parallel institutions where in the middle of oppression you can remove yourself and begin building the new institutions even while you are still in the old order. So I think that this is profoundly important to recognize that in the quest for political and social change, justice, these deep yearnings of the human race, it will take time and therefore planning is essential. Now, the group that came with strategy, Andre, am I pronouncing your name right? Um, I think that your group, you very swiftly saw that you should get to the front of the line. I think that's outstanding. Within the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, we had a shop that did nothing but research and that informed strategy. There were people in the movement who wanted to go to jail. They loved the direct action. They wanted to be arrested. Sometimes people don't believe me when I talk about this. They really wanted to go to jail. Uh, one of my colleagues once leapt up onto an Atlanta policeman, just leapt up onto him. She was so desperate to be arrested. <laughs> That'll do it. Gandhi was always talking about courting arrest. But we had a shop where people never participated in anything in the street. They only researched what are the corporations at work in Birmingham. What are the corporations at work in Chapel Hill, wherever? So, Andre, I think I, you were at the end of the group, and I saw you move swiftly to get there. And I think that this is something that I hope none of us ever forget. Get the strategic group going as early as possible. A small group working on strategy and research that does not have the imperative to take part in street actions or the building of community institutions is very important. And uh, I would say that in the planning of particular campaigns, you also need that strategy group to work on this campaign or that campaign or the other campaign. Um, Mohammed, you mentioned momentum. Crucial word. And what this exercise is about is sustaining a movement, but we could equally say sustaining momentum. This is exceedingly difficult. It is very, very easy, as Myra has suggested, to try this and then try that. You wake up in the morning and you try this, and you wake up the next morning and you try that. This is, in fact, what a lot of civil resistance was in the 19th century, as people began working on things like having less than a seven-hour work week, as people began working on things like ending child labor, as people began working on things like not having to work for 11 or 12 hours a day with no breaks. They were trying this and they were trying that. They didn't understand what would work and what would not work. So I think your point, if you think about how imperative it is to maintain momentum, this will help in the guidance of what your strategy will be. And you can actually continue to raise that question for yourself. Now, with regard to direct action, let's see, where was direct action? Who raised direct action?
demonstration. Okay. Uh, here's, here's the point that I wanted to make. I think you've all probably heard of the Selma March. There's a movie now in 1965, the big march across a bridge in Selma, Alabama. And uh, John Lewis, the chairman of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, was beaten. His skull was damaged. This was actually the last big direct action of the civil rights movement. From then on, our organizing efforts were political and economic. More long term, more getting a grip on the structures of power and the institutions that persisted in the maintenance of racism. We believed that we had come to an end of the utilization of direct action. SNCC was in fact split on whether or not to participate in the Selma March. I was one of those who was against it. Almost half the organization was against it. Some in the end got into cars and moved to Selma. Some were even flown into Selma at the end. But we really had doubts as to whether this was going to be as effective as we thought the change was needed. So direct action, what does it actually mean to pick up Catherine's comment? Yes, you want to try a definition? Direct action is where you are directly confronting the powerful institutions or government in a way that they can't escape your gaze. So to me, a march is a parallel protest to where the decisions or the problems actually are. Actually are. So um, well, we've, I... we've got different definitions. I would say a march is definitely not a direct action. A sit-in in a political office is a direct action because you're confronting them and they have to respond to you. No one has to respond to a march. Well, you've, you've gotten us started on a good working direction, a, a good working definition. The term nonviolent direct action means you take the people power to the source of the grievance. In other words, you do not work through representatives. You do not work through agencies. You do not ask this NGO to represent you. You do not go to this parliamentarian and ask that she introduce a bill. You go right to where the problem comes from. That's the meaning of nonviolent direct action, and it's a, part, it's a basic component of the canon of civil resistance. It's a good term to become familiar with, but at its essence is that you're not working through representatives. You're going right to where the issue is. So the problem could be in the parliament, and it could be parliamentarians that decide to take direct action against other parliamentarians. In that sense, it's a term that is usable in many different contexts, as are many of these terms. I want to pick up on what uh, Ade Adejo, Adejo, have I pronounced your name properly? Yes. Adejo. Yeah. Um, the smallness you mention. I think that this is really essential, that um, there be small planning groups, and that they are not necessarily in evidence all the time. They are working quietly, because they are thinking long term in the, in the maintenance of the progression and the momentum. I want to share with you for myself uh, the need to care for each other. This is very important. One has to worry about fatigue, burnout, Burnout happens very, very quickly in movements. Everybody needs to be concerned about this, but there may be those who have to be particularly concerned about it. Rotations, people being sent out. I remember the day that Jim Foreman asked me, he was our executive secretary, if I needed to go home just to take a break. And the reason was that my job was communications. So I was working on getting out the news. The white press in the South had complete contempt for what was going on inside the civil rights movement. Atrocities against black people were considered not to be newsworthy. They were not reported. Black people were not even referred to by their proper names in newspapers, if they were mentioned, such as in a criminal trial, 
they would say the brown man. Judges would talk to black people like that. We had major problems getting the news out. Um, often I would work for 12 hours a day. Also across the south in SNCC people had my telephone number where I was living. One night I was wakened by a phone call at 3 a.m. and I fainted on the way to the phone. <laughs> Uh, when Jim Foreman heard this, he asked if I wanted to go home for a while. Taking care of each other, be, being concerned about preventing burnout, about rotations, perhaps the enlistment of third parties, finding people who are willing to take in somebody just to give them a break. Uh, the March on Washington, the thousands of people who came to Washington, they had no money to go into hotels. It was people who lived all across the District of Columbia who took them into their homes. Very important to keep this high on the agenda. How do we pr protect each other as human beings? How do we care for each other? How do we organize rest and recreation? I want to say just a couple, do I still have a little bit more time? I, okay, good, excellent. Um, I would say that one thing that has not come up but that I feel very strongly about is preparation for failure. Now you may wonder what I mean. So I'm going to tell you what I mean. In the Mississippi program, we organized many, many alternative or parallel institutions, cooperatives, freedom schools, 38 freedom schools taught by teachers who were recruited from all over the country. Um, we had uh, also a political party that was alongside the white Mississippi Democratic Party. It was called the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. We played completely by the rules and we decided to challenge the seating of the Mississippi White Democratic Party at the National Democratic Convention in 1964. For that, we moved across the state, helping local black residents present themselves at the precinct and ward meetings of the regular party. And then there were those. Somebody mentioned documentation. You mentioned documentation, didn't you? Ahmed, did you mention? No. no? Somebody who meant? Yes, yes, documenting success, but just documentation can be also essentially essential to the movement. We went to Atlantic City, the convention, with tomes of documentation on how black people had been turned away from the regular party. All of the action at a national, uh, national party uh, when I say all of the action, let me just retrieve that and say, usually the seating of a delegation is so minor that it only takes a second, a minute, at a political party. In this case, it was dragged out because of our challenge. We organized a challenge to the National Democratic Party coming from the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And this is what I want to share with you. And to this moment, I don't believe that anyone has written about this. I'm hoping I'll be able to do so in the coming years. None of us ever anticipated that we might fail. We worked so hard. The effort was so enormous. We had recruited 150 lawyers. We had outstanding volunteers from all over the country. We never anticipated that we would fail. The Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party had its own convention in Jackson, meticulously organized, and it elected 69 delegates to go to the national convention. All that President Lyndon Johnson wanted to seat were two. And the party regulars said they were not going to accept two seats. Now, in the long term, this was devastating to SNCC that we had not anticipated that we might fail. And so what I want to share with you is there's a necessity for people in different parts of the movement to raise this question, first of all, 
in any planning, what do we do if we fail? Are we ready? Do we have plan B? Do we have plan C? Or will we just announce that we have lost? So take that on board, and I'm happy to talk with anybody on the cruise who wants to talk more about that. But I would say that that is a very important component for sustaining a movement. Because what happened is that SNCC virtually collapsed as a consequence of that failure. So I think it's important for us to recognize success when it's hidden, however. Sometimes we can't even see success because of our inability as human beings to think long term. I remember somebody walking into the office one day and saying, well, we've got to get ready for the long haul. And I thought to myself, well, what does that mean? Is that five years? No, we needed far more than five years. It's very hard to think long term, but it's absolutely essential. And one of the things to do is, as you say, documentation of your success, because many little successes come together to make a, a big success. Maintenance of the training. I cottoned on to Hardy. Cotton is American slang. It comes from picking cotton. Picking cotton is very hard because it's sticky. It doesn't want to come off the plant. So when I say I cottoned on to Hardy, it means I got immediately why Hardy had picked out the dead middle in the continuum. It's got to go on all the time. And it's got to change with what the demands of the movement are. In SNCC, we stopped the training. And when we did, it opened the doors to people who were coming into the movement who had not been through the enormous orientations and preparations and sharing and bonding that those of us who had been working together had experienced. And that was the beginning of the black power phase where there was no program. It was just a slogan that one, of, one fellow leaped onto a stage and called out, what do we want? And the answer was black power. What do we want? And the answer was black power. There was no program. There was no plan. There was no nothing. But because of the disappointment in Atlantic City at the challenge of the Democratic Party, and because uh, we had not maintained the training, it was the beginning of the end. It was the beginning of the unweaving of the civil rights movement. So it's really very crucial to think about the training and to elevate it to a high, important status. What Martin Luther King used to do was to ask Jim Lawson to run a training session at every single meeting of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And he would put it on the program himself and pick a time when there was no competition and no conflict. And then Dr. King would come and sit up front 15 minutes early. This was in order to let everybody know through his body language that this was extremely important. So give training whatever symbolism, whatever psychological pizzazz you have to give it in order to sit, sustain it all the way through. Um, onlookers observing nonviolent movements often comment on the boldness. They say, where did the people, this is good, where did they, how do they get this boldness? Where, where does that come from? What I want to share with you is that that boldness often comes from tasks that you might think were, think were not very important. For example, we had to do a lot of literacy training in order to prepare African American citizens to go down to the courthouses to try to register to vote. The odds were completely stacked against them, but they and the staff believed that the attempt was essential. For one thing, it allowed people who were in communications, like Julian Bond and myself, to get on the phone to the Department of Justice in Washington and to say how many people had tried to vote in a particular county that day and that they had been turned away. So, um, that would be important. The evaluation comment was also important. This is one of the toughest things for a movement, I would like to say. This is extremely difficult. One thing that we did was to have senior advisors who helped us 
They included the historian Howard Zinn and Ella Baker, um, who is, I will be talking more a little bit about her on Thursday in the Women in Civil Resistance. I think I'm almost at the end if your appearance at my left shoulder is uh, meaningful. Andre, I think you used the term, see it to the end. You recognize those words? Perhaps they just spilled out, but they're really important. I just, I've mentioned this already, but I'll emphasize it again. It's important to have clarity about your goals, what it is that you're actually seeking, particularly the harder it is to achieve, and to see it to the end, to realize that this is going to be a torturous, long-term process. But that, that exercise of seeing it to the end is essential, and that's part of where lifting fear comes from. When people look at a demonstration and they see individuals from very modest backgrounds who appear to have no fear in front of the police, they may not realize that that individual has had 200 hours of literacy training to prepare to try to vote. They may not realize that there have been mass meetings going on in hundreds of churches preparing people for how to handle police attacks, how to roll up and protect your vital organs, protect your kidneys, protect the back of your, your neck. This is where the boldness comes from. It comes from preparation and planning. Do you want to introduce the little handout? Mm -hmm. no, we're not first. handing them out, but we have tables, remember? Um.